B. Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Thursday, August 27th, 2020. Following the police shooting of Jacob Blake and then the vigilante shooting on the streets of Kenosha, Wisconsin, NBA players led a professional sports walkout yesterday. And because the Republican National Convention is mostly pre-recorded, there was uh, no commentary except for a brief and infuriating remark from Vice President Mike Pence that we'll get to here shortly. But as we begin this coverage, I want to note that sometimes these events that have national significance hit very close to home, and not my home, but Steve Horn. Steve has been a frequent guest on this program for years now. He's an environmental reporter who grew up near Kenosha, Wisconsin. He went to University of Wisconsin at Madison, now lives uh, near San Diego. And I was touched by his Facebook post yesterday. It's really been hard for me to concentrate today, given how close last night's deadly shooting was to my childhood home. It happened near where I went to kindergarten and preschool and my childhood synagogue. And watching it happen on a Twitter live feed was surreal and jarring. But then it got worse. I also learned that my cousin's best friend, Anthony Huber, was gunned down and killed by the 17-year-old AR-15-toting Blue Lives Matter fanboy. It all got to be a bit much, and I broke down and cried a bit this afternoon. Not going to lie. The far right is on the march. They're increasingly enmeshed in law enforcement, and this is now the second lethal right-wing shooting with which I've either had close contact personally or via family. The Poway Synagogue shooter only lived about two miles from me in San Diego, in the same general area of the city, and that was no picnic to live through as a Jewish person or a funeral, funeral service I ever wanted to attend a year and a half ago. And his cousin posted a note about Anthony Huber, and I'll read that. I'm at a loss for words right now. Lost my brother, my best fucking friend. Shit really hits home. Really gonna miss you, man. My heart hurts just thinking about this. So many good memories with you, bro. There is nobody else on the planet like you. Such a unique soul, so talented and smart. The skateboarding scene will not be the same without you. We taught each other so much. So many nights staying up until 4 a.m. just so we could skate. So many deep conversations about life and the future. A future that was cut short. Cut short by this horrible world we live in. People disgust me. You're gone now, but you will never be forgotten. Say hi to our great buddy John up there for me. I hope you guys are having a good time catching up. I love you, brother. Your legacy will live on forever and always. And I find that very touching. And it personalizes the loss. And Anthony Huber was the second person allegedly shot by Kyle Rittenhouse on the streets of Kenosha. And Anthony Huber lost his life trying to disarm Kyle Rittenhouse after he had witnessed him shooting the first victim. So he is a skateboard hero in more ways than one. And just to give you the latest, last night the streets were largely peaceful in Kenosha. More than 200 federal agents and marshals have been deployed to Wisconsin, part of the Trump Palace Guard. Governor Tony Evers has ordered hundreds of National Guard troops already into the city. And so I am glad that there was not further violence or loss of life on the streets of Kenosha last night. And as you may know, I don't talk much about professional sports. I'm not invested. I, I, it's not like I'm an alien. <laughs> but I don't devote any time to professional athletes in the NBA, the NFL, or Major League Baseball. 
It does, uh, you know, creep into my consciousness from talking to others and scanning the sports page. And yes, I am aware that the NBA is playing at a bubble at Disney World in Orlando. And I found it quite powerful that led by the Milwaukee Bucks and encouraged by LeBron James and the Lakers, that the NBA took the night off last night in a wildcat strike led by its players. And since the cop shooting of Jacob Blake occurred on Sunday night, it appears to be the addition of the young white man with an AR-15 and his shooting at three people, killing two, that pushed the NBA players over the edge. And I've linked to a commentary by Dave Zirin. And keep in mind, I'm not a sports guy. But I have enjoyed conversations with Dave Zirin, who is a sports reporter, who also covers the, the culture of professional sports in this country. And he put up a quick post at The Nation last night. He said, this is without precedent in the history of sports. The Milwaukee Bucks, arguably the best team in the NBA, have gone on strike, refusing to leave the locker room for Game 5 of their playoff series against the Orlando Magic. Their decision stopped the sports world on a dime. And shortly after the news, the Milwaukee Brewers baseball team announced that they would skip their game last night. The Brewers and Bucks are refusing to play in solidarity with the demand for justice for Jacob Blake. Immediately, the Bucks' decision had a catalytic effect on the league. The remainder of the playoff games today, by decision of the players, have been canceled, including the game between the Lakers and the Portland Trailblazers. Call it a wildcat strike, call it an uprising, but whatever you call it, the actions of these athletes have repercussions far beyond sports. When LeBron tweeted, fuck this man, we demand change, sick of it, in support of the Bucks. He didn't get love just from NBA fans. Future Congressman Jamal Bowman and Representative Ilan Omar immediately endorsed his sentiment. And Zirin quotes the guard for the Toronto Raptors, Fred Van Vliet. We've got to take responsibility as well. Like, what are we willing to give up? Do we actually give a fuck about what's going on? Or is it just cool to have Black Lives Matter on the backdrop or wear a T-shirt? Like, what does that really mean? Is it really doing anything? The players were itching to do something, and now they have. And back to Zirin's voice, the timing of this strike by the Bucks and now the players of the NBA has the potential to turn politics inside out. They are posing the question of the all great strikes posed to political people who hate sports and sports fans who hate politics and to white fans who love them on the court but are oblivious to black lives when the final whistle is blown. And that question is, which side are you on? Now, they have announced that uh, after LeBron and a few others talked about canceling the rest of this uh, truncated season, the NBA has apparently moved back from that brink, reports that the season would end prematurely, have shifted, and it's not clear when the playoffs will resume, but it is not expected to happen tonight. So I, I don't really take a position on whether they should have canceled the rest of this very brief season, which, of course, is an attempt to finish up the 2019-2020 uh, season. And the playoffs produce bonuses for the players. So they are putting income on the line in a year when many of them lost income. Now, they don't all get paid by the game. Each contract can be different. But I applaud. They're standing up, and this is more than taking a knee. It was four years ago today that Colin Kaepernick first took a knee 
at an NFL preseason game. And there was silence from the (laughs) speakers at the Republican National Convention last night. And we'll get to that part of the story in a moment. One of my habits is, before I go to bed every night, I flip on the tube and watch Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. He's a biracial man from South Africa who, since he took over from Jon Stewart, has demonstrated an incredible ability to absorb the American culture and not just the pretty parts. Last night, his opening segment was funny, and then he got serious about Kenosha. And he had some striking comments. Quote, I'll never get used to how quickly police go from issuing commands to using deadly force. Whatever happened to warning shots or tackling a suspect? Like, are we really meant to believe that the only two options a cop has is to do nothing or shoot somebody in the back seven times? Black people are tired of hearing, I'm sorry, and then nothing happening. Because essentially, what they're really hearing is, I'm sorry this is happening, and I'm sorry that it's going to happen again. And when he described the 17-year-old white teenager who was accused of taking those two lives on the streets of Kenosha and that Rittenhouse had claimed on Facebook that he was defending a business. But Noah said, that's some bullshit. No one has ever thought, oh, it's my solemn duty to pick up a rifle and protect that T.J. Maxx. They do it because they're hoping to shoot someone. Enough with this militia bullshit, he said. This isn't the Battle of Yorktown. It's a bunch of dudes threatening people with guns. How come Jacob Blake was seen as a deadly threat for a theoretical gun that he might have and might try to commit a crime with, but this gunman who was armed and had already shot people, who had shown that he was a threat, was arrested the next day, given full due process of the law, and generally treated like a human being whose life matters? Why is it that the police decide that some threats must be extinguished immediately, while other threats get the privilege of being defused? The answer, Noah said, is is clear. The gun doesn't matter as much as who is holding the gun, because to some people, black skin is the most threatening weapon of all. And I criticized the New York Times yesterday, and compared its coverage of this developing story to the work of Alan McLeod at Mint Press News. There was no follow-up report at Mint Press today, but the corporate media, with all of its resources, went into crisis mode, wall-to-wall coverage mode, and we've learned a lot. Kyle Rittenhouse is a 17-year-old high school dropout with a fixation on the police and on Donald Trump. He attempted to join the Marine Corps, Marine Corps in January, but was disqualified for reasons that we don't know yet. But he had joined his local police cadet corps. He was also a volunteer for the local fire department. And he lives alone in an apartment with his mother, Wendy Rittenhouse, a single mom and a nurse's assistant, next to a quiet park in Antioch. According to court records dug up by the Chicago Tribune, the mom sought an order of protection from police in January of 2017, claiming that a classmate of her son's had been threatening him and calling him dumb and stupid. And in Antioch, Records that uh, use the same address as the written house apartment show that on August 4th he received a citation for speeding 24 miles an hour over the limit on a freeway and another for operating without a valid license. Now, one of the big questions, and even pro-gun people notice, that this 17-year-old kid had no business with a semi-automatic rifle. He was underage to possess it. And even though Wisconsin has an open carry law, 
it only applies to adults. And if you have been scouring the Internet like I have, there is a lot of footage of Kyle Rittenhouse on the scene in Kenosha on the night of the shooting. And he told some reporters that uh, he was working to protect property in Kenosha. Now, BuzzFeed has uh, published a photo of one of Trump's mob rallies that was uh, earlier this year, I think in January, in Des Moines, Iowa. And they circled a picture that looks a whole lot like Kyle Rittenhouse sitting in the front row of a Trump rally. Also in uh, confirmation of that, Rittenhouse posted a TikTok video of a portion of the, uh, well, we can't call it a speech, the ranting ramble that uh, Trump delivered. And, of course, uh, the Trump campaign says they uh, don't know this guy. The individual has nothing to do with the campaign. And we fully support our fantastic law enforcement for their swift action in this case. But as you'll learn... The fantastic law enforcement in Kenosha is accused by some eyewitnesses of kettling protesters, corralling them and moving them in the direction of the armed white vigilantes. The fantastic law enforcement of Kenosha thanked Kyle Rittenhouse for being there and tossed him a bottle of water. They didn't ask for his ID, and if you look at him, he doesn't appear to be shaving yet. So this is a, it's a very difficult set of circumstances. It produces some predictable reactions from the right, the pro-law enforcement community. And... They selectively view what they consider to be the provocation that Kyle Rittenhouse faced because he was chased by protesters after he had already fired his weapon. And then they claim it was self-defense when he was running away from the protesters who were chasing him. And I believe Anthony Huber was one of those people chasing him. And he tripped and fell. And it was while he was on the ground that he started firing again. In addition to the picture of uh, Rittenhouse in the front row of the Donald Trump rally in January in Des Moines, we've learned that he was uh, a member of the Lindenhurst Grays Lake Haynesville Police Department, those are all communities in northern Illinois, their public safety cadet program. And there are pictures of him in uh, police uniforms that appeared to be part of his uh, fantasy world or fixation. We're now learning that a former member of the local government board, which is called Alderman in uh, Kenosha, 36-year-old Kevin Mathewson, who is described as kind of a, you know, a fringe player who got elected. And under the banner of the Kenosha Guard, a self-styled militia group, he put out a call to arms on Facebook. Any patriots willing to take up arms and defend our city tonight from eagle evil thugs? Now, we don't know yet if Kyle Rittenhouse actually saw that post and responded to it. But it's one of the leads that is being investigated. And the fact that a former alderman of Kenosha was one of the people suggests that the collaboration, or the, <laughs> at, at minimum, the tolerance of the local police and sheriff's deputies for the vigilante groups 
is not something that's new. The New York Times has assembled with uh, one, two, three, it looks like nine reporters, a timeline of the events. About two hours before the first shooting, a producer of a video live stream interviews Rittenhouse at a Kenosha car dealership. He's there with several other armed men. Some are positioned on the building's roof overlooking the parking lot where vehicles had burned the day before. On the live stream, he identifies himself as Kyle. He later speaks with Richie McGinnis from the Daily Caller. That's a conservative website if you don't know about it. Rittenhouse says he's there to protect the business. He calls it his job, although there's no indication that anybody paid him or uh, assigned him to guard that location. And in a separate video squib, He says that he was pepper sprayed by someone in the crowd of protesters. And in most of the footage that the Times says it has reviewed from before the shootings, Rittenhouse is uh, seen in that general area. But about 15 minutes before the first shooting, police officers drive past Rittenhouse and the other armed civilians, and that's when they thank them for being there and offer them water out of appreciation. Rittenhouse walks up to a police vehicle carrying his rifle, talks to the officers, and he eventually leaves the dealership, and we don't know why, but he is barred by the police from returning. Six minutes later, footage shows Rittenhouse being chased by the group of people into the parking lot of another dealership several blocks away. When he is being pursued by the group, an unknown gunman fires into the air. It's unclear why. Rittenhouse turns toward the sound of gunfire as another pursuer lunges toward him from the same direction. He then fires four times and appears to shoot one man in the head. Rittenhouse then is seen making a phone call. Then he flees. That's when he's being chased. People screaming, that's the shooter. This is when Rittenhouse tripped, falls to the ground, He fires four shots as three people rush toward him. And one person, presumably Anthony Huber, appears to be hit in the chest and falls to the ground. Another is hit in the arm and runs away. He's described as carrying a handgun. The Rittenhouse gunfire is mixed in with the sound of at least 16 other gunshots that ring out at this time. And in the final scene that I've seen on video from several angles, Rittenhouse is walking down the street. I believe it's Sheridan Road. And we see the police vehicles that had been uh, idling nearby follow the direction of the gunshots that had been heard. And as Rittenhouse walks uh, down with his gun pointed to the ground and his hands in the air, appearing to expect that the police are going to at least talk to him, if not detain him. The police drive by several of the vehicles. So that is the version of events compiled by the New York Times. Then we look at coverage of what I see as narrative control attempted by the local sheriff, whose name is Beth, that's his last name, and the police chief of Kenosha. David Beth is the Kenosha County Sheriff. And in my view, they are attempting to spin this up for the benefit of the officers who were negligent, who did not pick up written house, He went home that night, and the Illinois authorities who picked him up had to extradite him to Wisconsin, even though the, you know, state line is very close there. And I believe what they're attempting to do is play down the way the officers coddled these armed vigilantes. And here's a description from Esquire Magazine's Charles P. Pierce. 
At an afternoon press conference, Kenosha law enforcement officials bizarrely seemed determined to talk about anything except the two murders Tuesday night. Sheriff David Beth went on and on about closing the area freeways, and Police Chief Dan Miskinis gingerly tiptoed around the notion of vigilantism. Nobody seriously addressed the question of how an armed teenager allegedly killed two people then walked through the law enforcement cordons to go home. At one point, Beth declined to say whether the presence of the militia exacerbated the tension and violence on that night. And we've also seen the efforts at damage control and narrative control exercised by the police chief and the sheriff in describing that Jacob Blake had a knife. And I tangled with somebody on Facebook about this last night because I described Blake as an unarmed black man. And in the video I saw as he walked in front of his SUV, opened the driver's side door, he was not armed. And now they're saying there was a knife. And that Blake has admitted that there was a knife on the floor of the vehicle in the driver's position. And I've heard people attack Blake because he was the subject of a restraining order, that he was accused of domestic violence, that he has four children with different names, suggesting that they were uh, mothered by different women. And none of that is relevant. It is intended to prejudice people and to distract you from the... Gross behavior and the incredible lack of professionalism of the policeman who fired seven shots into Blake's back. And I want to credit Philip Bump. He writes for the Washington Post, and often I uh, don't agree with him. But he connects the events of the Republican National Convention the commentary that's been delivered night after night about anarchists flooding our streets and Democratic mayors ordering the police to stand down, about like what Jim Jordan accused Democrats of, they refused to denounce the mob and their response to the chaos, defund the police, defund Border Patrol, and defund our military. And he added gratuitously, they're also trying to take away your guns. And you may have seen the, the video from Mark and Patricia McCloskey, the St. Louis couple who brandished firearms at Black Lives Matter protesters who were marching through their rich neighborhood on their way to the mayor's house. Make no mistake, no matter where you live, your family will not be safe in the radical Democrats' America, said Patricia McCloskey. When we don't have basic safety and security in our communities, we'll never be free to build a brighter future for ourselves, our children, our country. That's what's at stake in this election. So I am not suggesting that there is a direct connection. We don't know if Kyle Rittenhouse was watching. But given his devotion to Trump and Trumpism, it's pretty likely. And while there are more direct triggers of the guy from Florida who mailed pipe bombs to, what, a dozen Democratic leaders and a couple of media outlets that had been attacked by Trump, and the Pittsburgh Temple shooter was clearly a Trumper who was killing Jews because they were providing aid and comfort to what he viewed as illegal immigrants. So I can't make that kind of direct connection at this point. But the bigger picture factors are pretty clear. And Mike German, the former FBI special agent who worked undercover for a time, he's quoted at length in an article at The Guardian today, concluding that U.S. law enforcement officials 
have been tied to race, racist militant activities in more than a dozen states t- since 2000, and hundreds of police officers have been caught posting racist and bigoted social media content. And I'll note that that has happened right here in San Francisco. German's report notes that over the years, police links to militias and white supremacist groups have been uncovered in states including Alabama, California, Connecticut, Florida, Illinois, Louisiana, Michigan, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, Washington, and West Virginia. And German says the exact scale of ties between law enforcement, uh, law enforcement and militias is hard to determine. Nobody is collecting the data. Nobody is actively looking for these law enforcement officers. And German went on to say, far-right militants are allowed to engage in violence and walk away while protesters are met with violent police actions. This negligent response empowers violent groups in dangerous and potentially lethal ways. The most violent elements within these far-right militant groups believe that their conduct is sanctioned by the government. Therefore, they're willing, much more willing, to come out and engage in acts of violence against protesters. And I'll note that I had a great interview with Mike German. I have linked to it. It it occurred last December. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast at peterbcollins.com. Well, the Jacob Blake shooting and the aftermath has produced renewed protesting. The 91st night in Portland, Oregon, and the first night in uh, over a week that the police did not declare a riot and deploy tear gas. So there were some incidents, but nothing that uh, I consider significant. And uh, there were 11 people arrested in Portland last night. In Seattle, there were three arrests and two separate demonstrations on Wednesday night. On Capitol Hill, protesters broke windows at three businesses. Police rushed in from behind, arrested two people. At the uh, State Patrol building, a separate group of demonstrators held a vigil. One person was arrested. People used pepper spray on the crowd. Minneapolis was the scene of some confusion that apparently was effectively defused because on Wednesday afternoon... A black man who was wanted in a homicide fatally shot himself as the police closed in on a street where he was located in downtown Minneapolis. But the public officials went public right away, said that this was a suicide. It did not involve a police shooting. And they imposed a curfew nonetheless, but uh, appears no major uh, violence or property damage occurred. And across the bay from me in Oakland, hundreds of protesters took to the streets in solidarity. There was some minor damage to the Alameda County Courthouse. But what really rankled me last night, and I I must say that I am grateful that tonight is the last night of the Trump unreality show, and I do feel compelled to watch it so I can comment on it here I can't just uh, leave it to others to suffer through this. But it has uh, been difficult at our house because Kathy absolutely refuses to watch. But what really rankled me was watching Mike Pence accept the nomination to be Trump's vice president again. And again, the optics that Trump uh, sets up are very powerful for his base. This was staged over in Baltimore at Fort McHenry, where the Star-Spangled Banner uh, was written to uh, record an event from way back in the 19th century. And so let me just read the two paragraphs that I posted on Facebook after watching Mike Pence. Unfucking believable I wrote. Just watch Trump's chief bootlicker, Mike Pence, wrap himself in Jesus and the flag and call for Nixon-style law and order in Kenosha. Of course, he ignored that the protests were caused by the brutal shooting in the back of an unarmed black man in front of his three kids. 
And even though he gave one of the few live speeches last night, he didn't mention the 17-year-old white vigilante who killed two nonviolent protesters and who appears to have been abetted by the cops, who made no move to arrest him at the scene. But that's not all. In the next breath, he brazenly lied that federal security officer David Underwood was, quote, killed during riots in Oakland, end quote, when the shooter charged with this murder is a Boogaloo boy who's also an Air Force military police officer. These are not mistakes. They are blatant lies. Does he rationalize them as heavenly deception? In service of God's chosen authoritarian? I've covered presidential campaigns since Nixon. This is the lowest ever. And I expect Don and Mike to go even lower. And the only outlet that I've seen try to correct Pence is over at BuzzFeed. And I don't have the writer's uh, byline in front of me. But he wrote, Pence praised law enforcement and then referenced David Underwood, an officer with the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Protective Service, who was shot and killed in May. He was shot and killed during the riots in Oakland, California, Pence said. Dave's heroism is emblematic of the heroes that serve in blue every day. The vice president's claim seemed to insinuate Underwood was killed as a result of or even at the hands of Oakland demonstrators who were marching against police brutality. What Pence didn't acknowledge, however, was that the suspect behind Underwood's killing is believed to have been a member of the right-wing extremist Boogaloo movement and that, according to federal prosecutors, targeted the federal officer and used the cover of the protest hoping to spark anger, civil unrest, and a fresh civil war. But Pence made no mention of the suspected shooter's ties to right-wing extremists and instead denounced violence that has erupted during Black Lives Matter protests. And here was his own only reference to Kenosha. Quote, Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across the country, Pence said. Let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedoms to see Americans strike each other down. And his overall speech was dark and invoked the calamitous, apocalyptic, film noir view that uh, apparently dominates the stable genius, as he claims, who currently occupies the Oval Office. And Pence is a bootlicker. I mean, he just kisses Trump's ass and praises him sky high, even knowing that much of what he says is flatly false and that the rest of what he says is highly inflated. But Mike Pence is a former radio conservative radio talk show host, and he can deliver those lines very effectively. Pence also said, under President Trump, we will stand with those who stand on the thin blue line, and we're not going to defund the police, not now, ever. Joe Biden was quoted, the contrast tonight couldn't be clearer. We can choose four more years of fear, division, and hate, or we can choose a different path, one of hope, unity, and light. Well, that's a line from his acceptance speech last week at the Democratic National Convention. And let me be, be fair that the Democrats engaged in a lot of puffery about Joe Biden. They lied by omission more than commission. But the Republicans <laughs> are just so brazen. And they trot out these people who repeat the same false allegations, misquotes, efforts to paint every Democrat as a socialist, when they're only a handful. And, to their credit, the leaders at Wisconsin Lutheran College, who had scheduled Mike Pence to speak at a graduation this Saturday, have uninvited him. I'll bet his feelings are hurt. Oh, and get this. One of the video clips that was used to illustrate the carnage on the streets of America this summer. Well, there are four images used in a sequence, the fourth and most explosive. 
was actually filmed last October in Barcelona, Spain. And that shows that the Republicans aren't interested in fact-based reality programming. It's just whatever works, baby. And the footage is available uh, on Shutterstock, which is a, uh, a you know video stock image website. So my big takeaway from the Republican convention is that Trump owns dim bitches of the Republican Party. And forgive my language, I don't like to use the B word, but uh, it really fits here. Because the rank-and-file leaders of the House and Senate who call themselves Republicans have debased themselves and yielded to Trump. They're afraid of his threats and his tweets. He's popular in many of their districts. And so they just uh, go along with it. But uh, to my knowledge, there's only one Senate candidate Joni Ernst, who's up for re-election from Iowa, who was invited to speak. Now, there may have been others who were more mainstream Republicans who were not invited to speak or who were invited and declined. We don't know the back, back story. But the presentation is all about Trump and creating this whole Messiah complex around him. And... He may pull this off. He may win the election in November. But I think he has damaged his party so badly that they have little hope of uh, regaining control of the House. And I think they have less hope of holding on to their slim majority in the Senate. There are going to be a lot of roadkill, a lot of Republican roadkill, as a result of this strategy. And I want to thank Keith Tucker. I've been in touch with Keith for maybe 15 years now. He's a great political cartoonist. And he posted one on my comments about Mike Pence at Facebook. And I'm going to share it with you. It's uh, in the show file for today's podcast, right there in the middle. And it shows how Democrats are pushing Republicans off the ship and that Trump doesn't allow them to get onto his ship. And I think that that uh, offers a visual depiction of what I've just been describing. But speaker after speaker says that only Trump can save us from all the damage that Trump has caused. And when they talk about the economy and employment and how he's been so good for women and so good for black Americans. They leave out the period of time from March to August of 2020. And they just talk about the first three years when he rode the wave that Obama created in terms of jobs and economic growth. And Mike Pence, with a straight face, delivered the line, we're going to make America great again, again, last night. <laughs> then there was Kellyanne Conway, who offered no hint of the family divisions that are leading to her stepping down from the White House. She focused on how great Donald Trump has been for women. And his cabinet has very few women. The 200-plus judges he's appointed are largely white males under 50 who will be there for a long frickin' time. But she said he's just so great to work for. And then she left out Paul Manafort as she claimed that he had uh, humbled her by selecting her to manage his 2016 campaign. She shared that job with Paul Manafort, who's now in prison, but he was not available for comment. So I've reviewed a bunch of the fact-checking from the lies just in the last 24 hours coming out of Republican speakers at their convention. And let me just uh, list a few of them. One is uh, this guy, Madison Cawthorn. He is running for Congress in North Carolina's 11th district. And tomorrow I'm scheduled to interview his Democratic opponent, Colonel Morris Davis, 
And as I discussed with Patrick Martin, when we went through the list of all the CIA Democrats, those with military or intelligence backgrounds who are running for Congress this year, I disputed the notion that Mo Davis belongs on the list with all these other spooks and veterans. But Madison Cawthorn is 25 years old. He appeared in a wheelchair and described that he had been injured in a very bad auto accident. He forgot to mention that he is losing ground in his race because he went to Hitler's summer home, I think it was Berchtesgarten, because it was on his bucket list. And he demonstrated the kind of uh, faith-healing revival tone of this Trump-produced convention. Because at the end of his talk, a couple of guys brought out a walker, and he stood up from his wheelchair, as if Trump had just performed a miracle, enabling him to walk. Laura Trump, who's married to Eric, was a pretty effective speaker. Nonetheless, uh, she lied about the economy, and, as I mentioned, omitted any reference to the last six or seven months. And I'm looking here at some of the other lies. Pence claimed that Trump passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history. And uh, I'll just say that Ronald Reagan's tax cut in 1981 was almost three times greater. And for him to impugn the record of the revered Reagan... (laughs) That doesn't matter because none of, none of those Republican voters can remember any of that stuff. They have a very convenient form of amnesia. And that's enough of the fact-checking. Uh, there are too many lies to cover them all. Oh, and Melania. In her primetime address on Tuesday night, she claimed, or was, yeah, Tuesday night, I get confused. She claimed that uh, Donald Trump had fixed the opioid crisis. Only the statist- uh, statistics that are available show that fatal overdoses last year were up more than 10% from 2016. And that people on the front lines say that the pandemic has actually led to more uses of opioid, more addicts more overdoses, and the prescriptions for naloxone, I think that's how it's pronounced, the antidote, doubled between 2017 and 2018. So once again, they're declaring victory in a conflict that has not ended. This is a bit of a surprise today at her weekly news conference. Speaker Pelosi suggested that Joe Biden should bow out of a debate with Donald Trump, saying that she doesn't want him to dignify a conversation with Trump. Quote, I wouldn't legitimize a conversation with him, nor a debate. She acknowledged that the Biden campaign feels differently, but said she considers Trump's behavior during the 2016 debates against Hillary Clinton disgraceful. Quote, I think he'll probably act in a way that is beneath the dignity of the presidency. He does that every day. I think he will also belittle what the debates are supposed to be about. They're not to be about skullduggery on the part of someone who has no respect for the office he holds, much less the democratic process. But Biden said, I'm going to be a fact checker on the floor. And he's previously said that uh, Trump is afraid to debate him. Uh, I think Biden (laughs) is not a great debater. And Pelosi might be right about that. We have another insider book coming out of the White House, this one based on the accounts of former White House counsel Don McGahn. It's a book by New York Times reporter Michael Schmidt. And McGahn says uh, he wrote a letter of resignation several times that he was pressed to get Robert Mueller fired. And the juicy quote, McGahn uh, told his personal lawyer about Trump, I have a real fucking problem. I don't want to speak out of school, but he's saying some crazy shit. That's not really news, is it? The news that is good today is that Hurricane Laura was not nearly 
as devastating as it came ashore last night, downgraded from a Category 4 to Category 1 by the time I flipped on the TV this morning. Uh, the storm surge and the flooding was at about half of what had been predicted. So it's very serious, a lot of damage. Four deaths have been reported, and uh, the storm is still moving northward and uh, dumping a whole lot of rain. Every day when I remember, I pause to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins Podcast with your subscriptions. People like Andrea Hegland, Paul Karsh, Janet Steele, and Alice Carlson. They each chip in 5 or 10 maybe 20 bucks a month in some cases to help me buy paper and printer ink and keep the whole operation going here. So if you'd like to join them, I'd like you to. All you have to do is log in at peterbcollins.com forward slash sign up. Yesterday, I mentioned the protests that have been occurring in San Luis Obispo along the California coast. And Henry Garcica is an opinionated listener who lives in San Luis Obispo, and he objected to my depiction of the leader of the protests who is facing a stack of charges. Her name is Tiana Arata. So without further comment, here's his note. I have to respond to your trite, sympathetic slant of Tiana on what was clearly a reckless, dangerous rally led by a publicity-seeking drama queen. To come out on the freeway directing scores of followers to enter opposing off-ramps at a peak traffic hour is in itself a hostile, dangerous, and stupid move. They shut down the major north-south artery for California travel in both directions. I was blocked from going on the freeway just as this scenario was being played out as I live within a mile of the 101 where this took place. Many of those at the front of her protest mob had the righteously selfish attitude to suggest this was their right to make everyone on that freeway a captured hostage of their militant demeanor. There's very little sympathy for this group, and it was largely Tiana's clique of personal friends who made up the majority. A pregnant woman had to plead with these idiots blocking her car to let her continue to the hospital. Such was her urgency. Tiana was taping herself in an act of egotism and self-promotion, suggesting she was insisting on being on the news and planned it all along. The police were caught off guard, never expected this was part of the route. Police units had to block several on-ramps in both directions for some distance. Neighborhoods that are generally quiet and peaceful were suddenly swamped with heavy traffic. The professor that I mentioned has never been here for a protest, she wanted to suck up some publicity once this story grew legs and received national notice. This immature group of airheads can't even express an intelligent idea or thought behind what they want to see change. We're all facing increased sales taxes to pay for the exorbitant costs now put in place before each protest starts. All freeway access locations have highway patrol vehicles parked and ready to block any access. I will be in the next counter-protest, and it isn't going to be pleasant for these immature punk-ass pricks who don't give a shit about anyone else. Take your sympathy card somewhere else, Henry says in closing. Here's today's COVID-19 update, edited by Linda Lewis. Worldwide, the caseload of uh, confirmed coronavirus cases is just short of 25 million, and the death count is uh, estimated at 827,000. Here in the United States, the uh, case count is now at 5.8 million, the death toll at 180,000. Yesterday, there were 44,000 new cases reported and 1,222 deaths. And I asked Linda today to go deep on how well we can trust the data that we're being given. And in particular, if Trump's wish for less testing because it produces less cases has been uh, fulfilled? And the answer in short term is it appears that it has. And we're seeing less testing. And when just a month ago there were 70,000 new cases being reported a day, and now that's in the 40,000 range, that is pretty fast, and it could reflect reality. But does it? So she starts with a CNBC report from August 12th. For the first time in months, the daily growth of new coronavirus cases has steadily fallen over the past two weeks. 
No one's declaring victory, says Admiral Brett Giroir, the uh, White House testing czar. We continue to see signs of progress across the Sun Belt and throughout the country. But testing shortages in key states and other gaps in COVID-19 data call into question the accuracy of those numbers and whether the outbreak is really improving or whether cases are simply going undiagnosed. The decline in testing is particularly acute in some of the hardest-hit states. Texas isn't the only one that's seen a drop in testing in recent weeks. It's fallen in Florida, North Carolina, and Tennessee, which are home to some of the country's largest COVID-19 outbreaks. And here's a quote from Dr. Ashish Jha at Harvard. I really have come to believe that we've entered a real new emerging crisis with testing, and it is making it harder to know where the pandemic is slowing down and where it's not. Jha said the decrease in testing may be due in part to delays in test processing. And I do want to include that as a factor here, because are you going to bother to go get your nose poked when you know you won't get the results for 10 days? And that even if it comes back positive at that point, you don't know how accurate that positive can be. We also don't get a breakdown on the kinds of tests. And in some areas, the tests for antibodies are being mixed up with the tests for the presence of the virus. And some of the tests are more accurate than others. And none of that is broken out, and it leads to uh, data that really is unreliable, and it hampers the efforts to address this as a public health crisis. So Linda notes that she went to the uh, website at Johns Hopkins, and they list their uh, criteria. Related to positivity rates, our calculation, which is applied consistently across the site and predates most states' test positivity tracking efforts, we look at a number of cases divided by the number of negative tests plus the number of cases. We feel that the ideal way to calculate positivity would be the number of people who test positive divided by the number of people who are tested. We feel this is currently the best way to track positivity because some states include in their testing totals duplicative tests obtained in succession on the same individual as well as unrelated antibody tests. That's a point I just made. And later she notes here that the CRC calculates the rolling seven-day average separately for daily cases and daily tests and then for each day calculates the percentage over the rolling averages. Positivity rates can tell us whether a state's testing capacity is sufficient. Ideally, a state should be meeting or exceeding the recommended positivity rate, which is set at 5%. A rate over 5% indicates a state may only be testing the sickest patients who seek out medical care and are not casting a wide enough net to identify milder cases and track outbreaks. If a rise in cases is the result of increased testing, the percent positive line could look flat or like it is decreasing over the same period when cases increased. If a rise in cases is the result of increased transmission, the line could appear to be increasing over that same time period. And from the Texas Tribune, state officials this month disclosed hundreds of thousands of coronavirus tests had not been previously reported a backlog that has distorted metrics used to gauge the toll of the pandemic. This was the latest in a string of data problems that have plagued the Texas public accounting of the pandemic. While patients were notified of their test results, the cases were not reported to some local health departments, which meant that they couldn't uh, feed those numbers up the line to the state database, and they couldn't assign contact tracers or determine who may have been exposed to that person. And now a quote from Texas State Representative Aaron Zwiener. This pattern of folks at every level pretending like they they have everything handled, while behind closed doors they're so overwhelmed and behind that the data is meaningless. It's toxic and dishonest. And one of the Texas counties, Collin County, took the unusual step of stamping its coronavirus dashboard with a warning that officials lack confidence in the data that they're, they're providing. 
Quote, the commissioner's court is 100% certain that the data being reported for Collin County is inaccurate. In July, the state identified a separate issue with the private lab's data. Somebody had inserted a question mark in one data field that prevented over 350,000 test results from being transferred to the state system. So Texas is a, a good example. But imagine this replicated over the 50 states. And so... Fundamentally, it makes this data very unreliable. And then there are the White House secret coronavirus red zone reports. The Center for Public Integrity is collecting these weekly reports for all 50 states, but they're not always publicly available. And so when a so-called red zone or hotspot is identified, in some cases, the people in that hotspot aren't notified. So what we have here is a huge failure on a federal level to coordinate the data collection, the standards for it, and then the dissemination of the data after they have been collected. And we know that Trump has wanted to see the numbers go down, no matter what, we have the very curious transfer of collection from the CDC to a commercial firm in Pittsburgh. And now there are hints that it may be transferred back. And Anthony Fauci says that when the latest guidance about testing was issued by the CDC, that, well, I was under general, let me do this right. I was under general, no, I can't do that. I was under general anesthesia in the operating room and was not part of any discussion or deliberation regarding the new testing recommendations. I'm concerned about the interpretation of these recommendations and worried it will give people the incorrect assumption that asymptomatic spread is not of great concern. In fact, it is, says Fauci. In the new guidelines, this is so confusing. They were quietly published on the CDC website on Monday, caught attention of the media on Tuesday, the new guidelines stun some federal health officials who are generally briefed on these matters. And here in California, Governor Newsom flatly said that uh, he will not abide by these new guidelines because he doesn't believe that they're based on science. He thinks these are issued or at least uh, influenced by the White House. And so the director of the CDC that's Dr. Robert Redfield, is now saying that testing may be considered for all close contacts of confirmed or probable COVID-19 patients. It's confusing, and that is the intention. It's not a flaw. It's not a bug. It is the program. And quickly, two more stories before we wrap up. The Postal Service has a new little trick that they're using. They deliver a message to your mailbox that says that a package that you're looking for is being held at the post office at your request. Only the customers who are getting these notifications never requested that their mail be held. I don't know where that's coming from or what they hope to achieve, but it's just more nonsense and chaos confusion. And that's what Trump wants. And finally today, over at Mint Press News, a report that alerts us to the efforts to prevent Russian meddling in the 2020 election. So the former head of the NSA, Mike Rogers, leaned into the Russian meddling narrative in a recent NPR interview to justify increased surveillance, more proactive approaches to the threat posed on social media to the American electoral process. And as you know, I consider this to be really hyped. Mike Rogers' successor over at NSA, spook Paul Nakasone, revealed in a Foreign Affairs article published the other day that he had received authorization to carry out operations against Russian interference going back to 2018 and had sent an undisclosed number of defensive cyber operators to countries bordering American adversaries for the purposes of defending against foreign meddling. The article goes on to say 
that the Pentagon, the NSA, and the National Guard, under the U.S. Cyber Command, have established the Election Security Group. Oh, yeah, they're all over this. It's a partnership between federal, state, and local government and private sector entities. Can you say Palantir? <laughs> so uh, there's a little more to the story. I've linked to it, and you can check it out at your convenience. It's all in the show file for today's podcast at peterbcollins.com. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment. You're free to share it far and wide. You will find it on YouTube, and I'm still Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep smiling